Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Code Shakespeare Othello. Today we're doing Act 3, Scene 3, Part 2. What I do in this series is I first give you a quick nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five or more quotes that I think are useful to help you understand the play's character and themes. If you find these videos useful, please like us and subscribe and consider making a small donation to my Patreon account. The first part of this scene was, of course, the great inception scene. Painful to watch. It was it was a masterclass in psychopathology. It's when Iago convinced Othello that Desdemona was indeed uh, untrue to him. It starts with Desdemona agreeing to press Cassio's suit to Othello, which is Iago's plan, of course, because he wants Iago wants Othello to suspect Cassio and Desdemona of having an affair um, alone. Iago plants the seeds of suspicion in Oth Othello. That's the great inception process. Now walk, watch my previous video. I walk through the whole process and it's stunningly brilliant, chillingly evil. Desdemona does come and plead Cassio's case and Othello is confirmed, at, uh, initially confirmed in his love for her. He says, no, 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 I'll, 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 I'll uh, deny thee nothing. Alone again, Iago steps up the inception process and it, it works. It works a charm. Othello is the weak outsider, the vulnerable outsider, and he is susceptible to the manipulations of, of, of this psychopath, and it works. Now, the second half of this scene, which is what we're going to look at today, is the great handkerchief scene. It's the great MacGuffin scene. Desdemona returns and drops the handkerchief Othello had given her, and Emilia picks it up and gives it to Iago. Now, MacGuffin is a device used in a story. It's usually an item, like a, like a, like a plot device, or, or, or an item like the Holy Grail or something that kicks off the events of a, of a scene or carries along the plot. And what the handkerchief becomes here is, is, is visible proof, what Othello thinks is visible proof of Desdemona's deception. And we'll walk through that. Tortured and enraged, Othello returns and threatens Iago. Now, the handkerchief is very important to Othello, uh, as he claims, and it's probably true um, because it's a family heirloom, and, and we'll talk about that too. And so when he sees that Desdemona has lost it, uh, and in fact, it, he, it looks like she gave it to um, her assumed lover, Cassio, he's, he's absolutely enraged and confirmed again in his suspicions. He returns and he, and he basically slaps down Iago and he says, look, buddy, you've, you've, you've destroyed me psychologically and you'd better damn well have proof that, that what you're saying is true. So Iago, the very, very smart psychopath, he does invent several proofs that Cassio and Desdemona are lovers and the handkerchief, of course, is, is involved. It's the MacGuffin. Uh, Iago agrees to kill, at the end of the whole scene, Iago, th th there's, a, there's a holy, there's an unholy union between these two. There's a symbolic marriage of the two that we'll talk about. And in, in that union, the agreement is that Iago will kill Cassio and of course, Othello will kill Desdemona. At the end of my previous video, we saw Othello give a, a very sad soliloquy. He, he, he's, he's been incepted by Iago. He's raging. He's confused. He reveals his deep, deep insecurity as an outsider. He also reveals his all or nothing thinker, his temper, his potential for, 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 for violence, really. Um, uh, to be resolute is good. To be stubborn is not. And, and that potential danger in him uh, is revealed here. So go back and watch that video. Now, with that in mind, that's the mood that he's in. He's, he's in turmoil, absolute turmoil. And then Desdemona comes in completely naive and innocent and not completely unaware of what's happening. And she says, hey, we're, we're waiting for you. We're, we're, we're going to have dinner. Where are you? And he, of course, Othello, is, is sullen and, and, and removed and ill-tempered and just fuming underneath. He can't look his beloved wife in the eyes. He's confused. He tries to cover all that by, she says, you know, she notices it, of course, instantly. She says, why are you speaking so faintly? What's, what's wrong, Othello, basically? Are you not well? And he tries to cover it by saying, I have a headache, you know, classic, right? Um, she then, you know, enter the MacGuffin. She pulls out the handkerchief and she puts it over her, his head playfully saying, here, this, this, this will, I'll bind it for you and make you feel better. He takes the napkin and he throws it on the ground and then, uh, uh, then they storm out. They both move out and that allows Amelia to pick it up. So there's the great MacGuffin introdu introduction of the MacGuffin. 
Now I should talk about the napkin a little bit here. It, it's a handkerchief, uh, and 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 they make a big deal of it in this play, and in a lot of other older literature, uh, you might find that you know they're making a big deal of, out of out of a stupid little handkerchief. Because today we would just buy one, you know, for for a penny, you know, at at any at any uh, department store. Back in those days, no, they they were they were actually artistic achievements. They they were they were they were hand woven is the word. Uh, I, I don't I don't uh, embroidery hand embroidered. Uh, very lovely pieces of cloth, and so they were quite significant. They were they were hard to to come by. They took a lot of effort. Women would spend, you know, noble women would spend their afternoons doing this. It was an it was an art form, and so that's why it takes on some some significance here. Um, so, Emilia picks it up. Okay, she says, "I am glad to have found this napkin," and she it was the first remembrance from the more. My wayward husband hath a hundred times wooed me to steal it. Now this is where it gets weird. Uh, it, Othello did give it to uh, um, Desdemona, and Emilia knows this. And weirdly, she also knows that Iago has asked her a hundred times to steal it. But Desdemona loves it so much, for he conjured her she should keep it forever, that she reserves it forever, it evermore about her to kiss and talk to. So Emilia knows that this is a really, really, this is not nothing. This is an important item. Okay, now what? The, the big question here is a really interesting scene for Amelia. She's an interesting character. She's not a flat character. She's really, really interesting. She says, I'll have the work taken out and give it to Iago. So she agrees to give it to her husband. Strangely, when we have to ask questions, why? What he will do with it, heaven knows, not I. I nothing but to please his fantasy, to please his whims, do you see? So what this means is that I'll have, like I said, it's a, it was a work of art. So what she'll do is she'll copy the embroidery. It was a nice, lovely little design. She'll copy the design, and then she'll give it to, um, to, to Iago. That's the, they, they did that. That was a thing that they did back in those days. Now, why? Why on earth would she give it to her husband? She knows her husband. She must know. If you, are, if you were married to someone for any length of time, you know their character, even if you're lying to yourself that you don't know their character. If you think he's a nice guy, he's a nice guy, even though he's a jerk, somewhere you know that he's a jerk and vice versa for, for the, you know, you can reverse the, the male and female roles there. So why does she agree to give it to, why does she agree to give the napkin to Iago? Is she an abused wife, eager to please her husband? I think that's probably true. And I think the best evidence for that is here. What he will do with it, I don't know. I know nothing except to please his whims. Do you see? That's a very sad statement. It's a sad statement on a woman who has no agency over her own life. She just lives to please this guy who's going to slap her around, probably if she, psychologically and or physically slap her around uh, if, if she doesn't obey. So sad. We have sympathy for Amelia, sure. However, she she didn't even have to she didn't have to give it to him. She, the, Iago didn't even have to know that she found it. Do you see what I'm saying? And we've seen before. We've already seen a hint that perhaps she is resentful of Desdemona. I've said this in a previous video, and we're going to see it again. There's one more clue that's that 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 proves this as well, um, or or that suggests this as well that she's resentful of Desdemona. Desdemona has the perfect marriage. For the first half of this play, Emilia is 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 living in in hell. In the worst possible marriage, with a overly je with a jealous husband and a brutal, abusive husband, and she's looking at her friend who has the perfect life. Now, it would take a saint not to feel resentment towards that friend. Look, look in your own lives, ladies and gentlemen, in your cell, in the hearts of your of your friends and your own heart. It's hard. It's really, really hard to look at someone who's living a great life and not feel resentful. And what happens in those situations is that when we, when, when we have to swallow that every day, my life is crap and this person's life is golden, there's a desire to go for one of two things, to raise your own life up, that would be the ideal. Barring that, if that's impossible, what do you do? You strive to bring them down. Now that's a nasty notion, but it's true. And again, look into your own lives. Uh, I, to be, you know, if we're perfectly honest, we can see those things happening to lesser degrees or greater degrees throughout our lives. And we strive not to be that jerk, 
but it, it's, it's really, really tough. And great works of literature uh, build that kind of complexity into their stories. Uh, it's the old uh, Cain and Abel story. Um, that's the old, in the biblical tradition, um, the Cain and Abel story is exactly that. Bring someone down, someone who's more successful, bring them down to your level. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I, I don't know, it, it's not enough. It's not enough, the abused wife thing is not enough. If she was a saint, she, would, she wouldn't do that to try to please her husband. Now, which doesn't mean that that's not true. That's also true. That's the complexity of a great work like Shakespeare. Um, otherwise, is she stupid? The other explanation is that she has no idea how this will destroy, how this will hurt. Why would she want to hurt, hurt Desdemona? She knows that this is going to hurt Desdemona. Is she so stupid? Is she stupid in thinking that her husband's not going to do anything bad with it? Is she stupid in thinking that it's not going to harm her, her friend, her best friend? No, she's not stupid. I don't think she is. I think it's a combination of those two things. Very interesting. Oh, I forgot to show you this. Um, that's a beautiful little painting by Vermeer. It's called The Lace Maker. And it, it's just it, just an illustration of, of, of how important the, the lace and, and handkerchiefs and, and things like that were back in those days. That's, that's basically what Emilia will be doing with the, uh, with, 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 the, with the handkerchief. Okay, so what happens now is that we have to get the handkerchief out of Emilia's hands and into the hands of the villain who can then use the MacGuffin um, for his own evil purposes. So Iago does enter, and, he, and, and this, it's, it's, every exchange between Iago and Emilia is, is tainted with, with some level of cruelty. Uh, he says, are you alone? Don't chide me, I have a thing for you. So now she's going to give the, the object, the, the MacGuffin, to Iago. And he's, see, here, see, see the tone here, her, her trying to please her abusive husband? Um, and he turns it around and says, a thing for me, it is a common thing. And that's, a, that's got sexual innuendo. It's, 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 it's cruel and it's vulgar. There's Iago's baseness, okay, the theme of, of, of baseness and corruption. Uh, he calls her a fool. Do you see? Oh, is that all? What will you give me now for the same handkerchief? You see, she's trying to please her abusive husband. So that certainly there's more evidence of that here. He says, what handkerchief? Why, the handkerchief the more first gave to Desdemona, which you so often bid me to steal. So he immediately thinks, oh, you stole it? So what we can, what we can pull out of this is that uh, uh, Iago is corrupt and cynical on the, on the inside. And we've, we've talked about this before, and Shakespeare talks about this again and again and again. When we are, whatever character we have on the inside, we project onto the outside world. So we see what we expect to see. Iago is base and corrupt and cynical, and so he just assumes that that baseness and corruption and cynicism exists in everybody else. And, 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 and conversely, the naive people like Desdemona and Cassio and Othello originally, um, they tend to see the good in other people. Okay, so the other thing we can then, so a good wench, give it to me. So he takes it, he snatches it from her, okay? She says here, now to go back to what, this is what we talked about just, just previously. He says, if it be not for some purpose of import, so if you don't need this for any real reason, then please give it back to me again. Poor lady, she'll run mad when she shall lack it. So again, here's the big question. Why, if she knows that it's important, why on earth does she give it to, um, to Iago? First level is that she's trying to please the abusive husband. At the subconscious level, She's, she's, I believe she's resentful of Desdemona. And I'll provide more proof to suggest that later on as well. So there, the MacGuffin has been set in place and the wheels of the plot are in motion. Go, leave me, the jerk says, and then the jerk is alone for a short soliloquy. I will to Cassio's, in Cassio's lodgings, and loose this napkin and let him find it. So there's the, 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 the tool, the MacGuffin is gonna be used for this. Uh, trifles light as air are to the jealous confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ. Now there's an interesting statement here. So basically what it means is uh, insubstantial little nothings to people who are jealous can take on great, great, great weight, do you see? Now there, there's a bunch of things in here. There, there's jealousy, of course. So that's the, the, when you're jealous, you see things that aren't real. So there's also the, the theme of appearance versus reality. Love, jealous love, love is the destroyer. There's also that theme there. I find this one a more interesting theme. We see what we expect to see. Once you're primed, and remember Othello now is primed to, 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 to see something, uh, we see. We see what we want to see. We see what we expect to see if those thoughts are in your mind, which means there's another grand theme of Shakespeare's. We are indeed the agents of our own destruction. Everything now that Othello sees is tainted with what's already in him. 
It's not coming from the outside anymore. It's been incepted and it's in him. And he's projecting it all onto the world because he's been set up to think in a particular way. It's his thoughts. His own thoughts are what going is what is is has taken over the tragedy it's not a, it's not a iago anymore iago could actually leave this play right now shakespeare could have him get hit by a not a bus but shakespeare could have him getting hit by a by a horse on the way to 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 the pub or something like that and it wouldn't matter the, the, it's been set in motion everything's contained inside our hero othello and now he is the agent of his own destruction really really tragic Okay, so this may do something so you can see his, his gleeful, psychopathic glee. The rest of this, throughout, there's a couple of things here. Remember that one of the elements of the psychopath is that they, they take sport. Uh, they need this constant, need, this need for constant entertainment. And because they're manipulative and, and psychopathic, they take that sport, um, they, they find that sport in, in manipulating other people. So there's a psychopathic glee that we see in, in much of this, this scene coming up. The more uh, already changes with my poison, so there's the inception. Dangerous conceits, dangerous imaginings are in their nature poison, so that's that. He is the agent of his own destruction. Now Iago can just stand back and watch it all unfold. Which at their first are scarce found to distaste, but with a little, with, but with a little act upon the blood, burn like the mines of sulfur. So there's the seed. That's basically a summary of, of everything we talked about in the past couple of videos. Uh, well, the, the last video especially, of course, but the great inception scene. I did say so. Look, here he comes. Now here's the psychopathic glee. Look at him. He's watching, he's, he's looking at Othello storming in or gloomily, sulkily, you know, uh, uh, um, angrily brooding, walking into the room and he says, ah, uh, there's not a single drug, there's not a single medicine on the planet that will allow you to sleep in comfort. You'll never recapture the happiness that you had merely yesterday. Gleeful, gleeful, brutal, brutal. Othello enter, enters raging uh, and he says to Iago, you have set me on the rack, you have tortured me, and you better not be lying or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you, basically, what is what he says. And we see here for the rest of the scene, Othello's unraveling. He's, he's, he's not Othello anymore. He's some kind of monster. He's been thoroughly incepted by Iago. And remember we mentioned before that uh, one of the themes of, of language reveals character. What we see here when he's talking about Desdemona, there's no more thoughts of love. There's no, there's no more divinity in his in his thoughts of his 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 wife the marriage of true minds has been gone and she's reduced to a mere body okay mere physical uh, creature words like lust he imagines Cassio's kisses on her lips he says throughout here he says you know I you've set me on the rack I if I wish I didn't even know that she was sleeping around look how crude he gets I wish she had been sleeping with the entire camp all of these soldiers had been using her I wish that were the case if I didn't know about it, I'd still be happy. Do you see how crude he is? He ends here as well by saying farewell. All of my former self has been disintegrated. All of what I've known about myself, all of what I'm good at, my whole life is gone. My job as the great warrior is gone. But there's a double meaning on that word occupation. Not only as Othello, the man of action, the brave warrior, the confident man of, of, of Venice, you see, doing a great deed for Venice, that's gone. But also, that, the, the double meaning on that is, is that uh, his, his occupation of Desdemona's sexuality is gone as well. So again, there's crudity here. He says, you'd better prove Desdemona a whore. Ugh, really? You know, can you imagine him even th can, thinking that at the beginning of the play? Not at all. Uh, he, he, there's evidence here of, of Othello being very a very Macbethian character. He's brave, confident warrior. He's a man of action, and we've seen that already. That's well established. Like Macbeth has been established as that kind of character at the beginning of the play. But emotionally, he's he's weak. He's very very emotionally weak. He's not so capable. And we see him here as an all or nothing thinker. It's like Desdemona. She's she's basically dead to me. I'm dead to myself. This is my you know this this is my great farewell farewell to myself. Do you see farewell to the royal banners? Farewell to my warrior self. I am gone. Alienation from the self. We've talked about that before. The other, okay. He's he 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 is not himself. He is he he has been removed from himself. The fish out of water. Uh, he he he's he's in Iago's domain now, and he's he he in the psychological domain is Iago's domain, right? And he can't handle it. He's not very good at this at all. Um, that which is an understatement. Passion versus reason. Way too much passion. No reason. He's he, he hasn't seen. 
he hasn't seen any real proof whatsoever of, of Desdemona's uh, infidelity. He's just, it's just, he's operating on pure passion right now. Excess versus mod moderation, same thing, an excess of passion and, and, and not, enough, uh, uh, not, enough, not enough reason. Sad, sad, and it only gets worse. Give me the ocular proof. So this gets, the, the, the scene is really, really intense now and uh, Othello is, is, is physically threatening Iago with death. He says, you prove to me that you, I want to see, I want to see proof. And if you can't do that, then I'm going to kill you, basically is what he says. Uh, look, look at the language of chaos here. He says that you, you can't do, you are damned eternally. If you, if you are merely lying about her and torturing me, then you will be damned. The chaotic language here all throughout this scene. Remember at the very beginning, uh, Othello said, if Desdemona is dishonest, then, then chaos come again if he disbelieves for that's what he said and this is indeed chaos come again okay so uh how does iago respond to this that's the question he, he's been threatened with his life quite literally been threatened with his life and so he does what a great manipulator great psychopath does he turns it around very very skillfully manipulation and inception the manipulator presents the self as reluctant to tell the truth remember this we've seen this already he is the victim iago is the put upon victim he's humble he's the put upon in their honesty Okay, he says, oh, wretched fool. Oh, why did I even speak? Oh, I'm, I'm too honest for my own good. Why do I livest to make thine honesty a vice? Why is my goodness have become something that is bad for me? Oh, monstrous world, you are so cruel to me. Take note, take note, oh world, to be direct and honest is not safe. He, he, he turns himself into the victim. He plays the victimhood card. Now that's, that's it's a nasty trick, but it actually, it, it works. The other thing we see here is that he says, okay, fine, I'm not gonna take, I'll, 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 I'll love no friend, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna take, I'm gonna leave, I'm not gonna love you anymore, I'm not gonna love anybody, I've learned my lesson. God, it's so horrible. And then he, 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 he shams, you know, uh, uh, um, leaving, and, he, and that's the great manipulator. He sets the bait and allows the victim to seek their own destruction. And we, the, I turned all these things red in my previous video that, that indicate Iago just, you know, dropping a, a, a seed and letting Othello pursue his own destruction. And that's what he does. Look what he does. No, stay Iago. He doesn't let Iago walk away. He brings him back so that Iago can work more on him. I think my wife be honest and think she is not. I think that thou art just and think thou art not. I'll have some proof. He's losing it, or he's already lost it. He, it. There's total chaos of the self here, a total disintegration of who he was as the steadfast, noble, resolute general. Psychologically, he's a mess. He's not, he's not the kind of guy to be able to handle this kind of, uh, of psychological um, uh, warfare, I suppose. Her name, Desdemona's name, that was as fresh as, as the goddess Diana's face is now begrimed and black as my own face. At the beginning of the play, he said, at the beginning of the play, he said, I am of noble, I, I'm a nobleman. I, am, I have noble kinsmen. I am an aristocrat, is what he said nobly and forthrightly and confidently in front of all of the nobles of Venice. Not so now. He sees himself as being something very much less than the nobility of Venice. Uh, disintegration, complete disintegration of that, that, that noble self. On the battlefield, he is a guy who knows where he stands. Here, he doesn't know where he stands. I will have proof. I need to be satisfied. I need to know where I stand. I can't handle this indecision. I can't stand handling the ambivalent feelings that I have. Total loss of control. It's very much like Coriolanus. If you, if you, that's a great play too. Um, he, he's, he's, he, again, he's a great general. He's, he's a great leader, uh, and yet he can't handle uh, the psychological pain uh, and, and the confusion that that he feels. Uh, very, very deeply psychological play that is very very much like Macbeth as well the same thing happens there's a realignment happen, happening here a realignment with chaos the powers of chaos are depicted in Macbeth the play Macbeth as as satanic very much satanic the witches and and Satan behind the witches uh, represent that that chaos and Shakespeare uses that 
as, as a metaphor, the satanic chaos as a metaphor for our psychological turmoil. At the end of this play, at the end of this scene rather, we're going to see a, a, a satanic union between uh, Iago and Othello, very much like uh, a union that we see in Macbeth when he goes to visit, visit the witches. Yeah, a very, very, uh, very, very sad. He says here, you know, if there be cords or knives, poison or fire or suffocating streams, I'll not endure it. He says, if I can find some means to relieve myself of this pain, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll not endure this pain anymore. He can't handle it. He wants to either commit suicide or murder somebody uh, to feel some kind of satisfaction. Obviously, there's the reputation in Peripatia, reputation of, of, of everybody, reputation of Desdemona has been crushed here. It's appearance versus reality, of course, because there's only the appearance of, of, of well, that's what reputation is. It's, it's an appearance. And, and Desdemona is still pure, but her reputation has been sullied here in his mind and in what he thinks the mind of the world. Peripatia, a, a total reversal, like Coriolanus, like Macbeth, they start off in a position of nobility and honor, and they end in this, in this mess absolute mess. Nobility and baseness, again, that's where they start off in the position of nobility and they end up in this world where he, he, he paints himself in these, these awful, awful crude terms. I will be satisfied, says Othello, seeking his own destruction at the hands of the psychopath. And Iago says, well, how? How, how, how can I satisfy you, my lord? How, how can we have proof? Are you going to Supervi the supervisor, are you going to grossly gape on and watch her being topped by Cassio? Oh my goodness, do you see this? So here's Iago, the vulgar psychopath, gleefully twisting the knife in his victim. He's got Iago where he wants him, and he, he, he's enjoying seeing his pain by conjuring up these images of his of Desdemona being vulgarly topped by Iago. It continues down here. What kind of proof do you want, my lord? Do you want to see them prime as goats, hot as monkeys, as lustful as wolves in heat? Is that what you're looking for? We can't do that, sir. We can't do that. So here's the, the several themes, of course. It's his baseness. It's his vulgarity, his language revealing his character, his reduction of, of, of human interaction and human love as, as mere physical objects. Do you see, that's a reduction of Desdemona to that. Um, absolutely brutal. And of course, Othello is right along with him. Give me proof one way or, or the other. Give me firm ground to stand on. I, can't, I am a warrior who does well when I have my feet on the ground. I can't stand this not knowing. I can't stand the instability. I can't stand the ambiguity psychologically. I can't handle this. Give me proof, says the says poor Othello begging for his own destruction. Oh, sir, I don't really want to do this, but how shall we, how shall we do it? Let me see, let me see, let me think, even though I don't want to do this. Proof number one is just a straight up lie. He says, I heard, I was sleeping next to Cassio in the barracks and I heard him uh, speaking aloud in his sleep. He said, sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves. And then Cassio took Iago's hand and started kissing it. So it's a straight up lie. But what that is, is that the, it's the psychopath. It's the manipulator. It's smart manipulation. It's the manipulator priming the victim to reveal a more shocking lie. It's a form of gaslighting. So that that is rather insubstantial. There's no way to, to prove it or disprove it. Okay. And he says as much here. He says, Othello's buying it though. He, Iago's already has Othello convinced but he goes on and on. Othello's having a ball. He's having fun. He's arrogant. He's reveling in his own intelligence. He's reveling in his own manipulation of another human being. He says, no, but sir, this is only a dream. We need better proof than this. Even though Othello was ready to move on that insubstantial evidence. He says, okay, yes, yeah, sir, sir. Othello says, no, 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 it's a dream. That's proof, it's proof. You, you, you sold me, you got me at the dream. I'm fine, leave, let's, let's do it. Let's do what we have to do. And, and Iago says, no, but this insubstantial proof may help to corroborate other evidence that we have. And the evidence, of course, is going to be the MacGuffin. The proof number two is going to be the MacGuffin. And that's the kicker, okay? So you, the, the manip if you want to manipulate someone, you've got to prime them with something subtle, and then you can nail them with something that is, that, that is, that is uh, the nail in the coffin, basically. And he says, okay, but he says, he says oh, did you, ever, did you ever see a handkerchief, you know, that had this kind of embroidery on it? And he says, yes, it was my first gift to, to um, to Desdemona. 
Well, I just saw Cassio wiping his, a symbol of his manhood with the gift that you gave Desdemona. Okay, and that, again, it's, it's the nail in the coffin. It's, it, it just sends, her, sends Othello over the top. Works. Now we have a culmination. Now we see a culmination of Othello's complete and utter annihilation, his disintegration. Remember, this is a long scene. Think, remember how it began, slowly, slowly, intensifying, intensifying until he is at the absolute bottom in a hell, in a real, real, literal personal hell, satanic hell, is what, because we're going to see that at the very, very end here. We're almost finished. Um, look what he says. All my fond love... Thus do I blow to heaven. Everything is gone. Everything I love on this earth is gone. Everything. Arise black vengeance from thy hollow cell. That's hell. He's calling up hell. He's, he's completely destroyed. It's what we've already talked about, but it's the culmination. Oh, blood, blood, blood. Language reveals psychology. Language reveals character. He is, he is nothing but blood now. He is, he is pure animal violence. That's all he's got left in him completely disintegrated, very much like Coriolanus, very much like Macbeth. There's nothing left of him, nothing. Uh, Patience, I say, your mind perhaps may change, says Iago disingenuously. And look at this, this, this is important too, because we've seen uh, uh, Othello as the great resolute warrior, resolution being a good thing, stubbornness being a bad thing, all or nothing, or all or nothing thinking being not necessarily a good thing. So as I will never change Iago, and this is one of his character flaws too. If he was a more calm, rational person like Benvolio and Romeo and Juliet or something like that, he wouldn't he wouldn't go this far. Never Iago, I'll never change. Like to the Pontic Sea, whose icy current and compulsive course ne'er feels retiring ebb. So um, that's just a reference to the uh, the geography, the, the, the near the the Dardanelles in uh, in modern day Turkey. Uh, whose current never changes. It always flows in one direction. So his mind only flows in one direction. He is the warrior. And when you put him in, the, in his proper, when he's not a fish out of water, when he's a fish in water, that attitude is what saves nations. That attitude, that steadfastness, that resolution is, what's, would, which, what, is what would have saved Venice from the Turks if, if, it, if his power had been needed. In the psychological realm, it, it's not very it's not very useful. Sexual jealousy, of course, the extremes of sexual jealousy, excess versus moderation. Parapatia, there's the complete and utter destruction of him. The, he's the complete opposite of what he started off. A noble gentleman, rational, loving gentleman, and now he's a beast, okay? And the nobility versus baseness, it's all there. Now we get into the really bizarre, unholy marriage uh, between the satanic Iago and the previously angelic Apollonian Othello. In the face of heaven, I do swear revenge. It's, it's, it's taking on a, a, a religious significance here, but of course it's perverse, it's corrupt, uh, it, it's, it's, it's ugly, ugly, ugly. Iago joins him. DC, do not rise yet. He sits down with him. And so th there, there's the implication here of, of a kind of marriage scene where the both are kneeling at the altar and, and un un uniting themselves. Now, that's when we're not making this up because look what he ends the scene with I am your own forever, my love. Do you see? Take me for all that I am. Uh, witness you ever burning lights above. The, the the language here is that of when when Romeo and Juliet talk about love, it's all in divine images, the images of the candles, and it's holy, holy, holy. Love is holy. Well, there's a similar thing happening here. You see, witness you ever burning lights above. There's the image of of the heavenly lights, the candles that we see in Romeo and Juliet, which is not ironic. Here, it's ironic and perverse. Do you see? It's a corruption of that spirituality you elements those are those those are the heavens you elements that clip us round about witness see that the language of a marriage here in in the in the eyes of god witness this the the union of these two lovers do you see they are uh scary stuff iago the psychopath as pure divine perfect evil divinity 
a dark divinity, do you see? He is perfect evil. He's a satanic priest. He's a satanic, satanic figure. He's perfect in his malice, absolutely perfect. There's the Parabataya, of course, Iago and, and, and Othello in a grotesque betrothal. There's a union, and that's, that's the downfall of, of, of Othello, of course. He, Othello is now aligned with the base, quite, quite literally aligned with the base, spiritually aligned with the base, with the cruel and with the satanic. A complete separation, an alienation from the previous noble self, the Apollonian self, separation from that self, separation from all that is good as represented in Desdemona, a separation from God, a separation from humanity, and this holy alliance here uh, is a mockery of the alliance that two lovers make in the eyes of God to, to become to become one uh, as, as a married couple. I greet thy love, do you see? Uh, absolutely sad, sad, sad. All the same things we just talked about. Damn her, lewd minx, damn her, I'm going to murder her. I will withdraw to furnish me with some swift means of death for the fair devil. I'm gonna prepare my murder of the devil. Now that's incredibly ironic, of course, and suggests the appearance versus reality theme because in the eyes of Othello, she appears to be the devil, but the irony is, is that he has actually just made the alliance with the devil. The person who he has just, uh, uh, has just become betrothed to is in fact the devil, do you see? And there's that, that, that kicker at the end. It must be, it's, it, it's grotesquely, perversely orgasmic do you see? Iago has achieved what he's been building up to and he's enjoying it in the same perverse way that he would enjoy a, a sexual encounter. It is, it is that grotesque. It really, really is. Go watch a film version and you'll see how, how it's depicted. It's, it's brutal and sad and brilliant to watch Shakespeare pulling this off. And that was a devastating Act 3, Scene 3. Come back for my next video, Act 3, Scene 4. Thanks for watching.